Welcome to Velvet Legends. It's the show where we point a spotlight on selected entertainment professionals and tell you how we create art. Our legend today was nine years old when he started his eight-year-long dance studies in Berlin, Germany. His impressive career began in the year of 1996 when the 17-year-old German boy signed up at the German State Opera in Berlin, followed by engagements with the Zurich Opera House in Switzerland, Queensland Ballet in Australia, Victor Ulate Ballet in Spain, Ballet of Monte Carlo, as well as the Morphosis and Ballet Next in New York City, which is also the place where he decided to study acting for the next three years, followed by several performances in the Big Apple. Today he's working as an actor for movies, ballet master in Bavaria, ballet teacher in Berlin, and he's about to complete his master dance teacher at the famous Palucca School in Germany. A man with such a versatile career and being all over the place, we are happy to have him here today in our studio. Greetings and welcome to the show, Jens Weber. Hi, I'm <laughs> happy to be here on this Saturday morning. <laughs> <laughs> we are very excited also to have you on the show. Have you ever won a contest? I haven't really won a contest, but I've been to the final uh, at the um, European Vision Contest for Dance that used to be, it used to exist, uh, and it was at the time in Stockholm. I was I believe 19 years old and yeah it was already a big honor to you know to be in the finale and it was a live uh, a transmission so my you know my parents and everybody here the whole ballet school and dancers in the company could see it so I was very exciting this moment to to be on stage and dance live on TV and that and knowing that this was transmitted live in you know Europe. So, <laughs> so that was probably the biggest event in terms of competitions. Okay, okay, and, good. Uh, so no wet t-shirt contests or something like that? Oh, no, no, <laughs> some, not something like that. Um, good, and, good. <laughs> but who knows? <laughs> <laughs> You're still young. <laughs> what was your first paid job? My first paid job um, was actually my first engagement at the Opera House in Berlin. Mm -hmm. And I was 17 years old. I was a... Um, uh, yeah, it was not in full employment yet, so... Like an apprenticeship? Yeah, it was an apprenticeship, yeah, that's okay. right. And But for me, it was already, you know, a good amount of money and I was happy to get experience and especially in on such a, you know, old and known opera house, mm. uh, so it was an honor to be there. Now, then that must be more or less the same moment when you felt the energy of an applauding audience for the first time. What and how did you feel? I think it was a lot before because as a, as a little child or well, when I was 10 and 11 years old, um, I had already the chance because of uh, the professional ballet education mm. that I enjoyed uh, to be on stage at the State Opera House here in Berlin. So as a little kid, a little mouse, you know, in the Nutcracker, which is like the traditional ballet where children start to experience right. being on stage. So. That was amazing and especially with all these amazing dancers being on stage with all these fantastic soloists at the time so it was just unbelievable to be you know tiny and then being on stage and your parents watch and you know what you know what an honor so, okay yeah i think that was my first experience and then how how does it differ to today or like you know when when there's when you because maybe now you will have a different perception when when it comes to energy of applauding and appreciation of the audience? Yeah, I think, I think now, after so many years being on stage um, and having gone through ups and downs, I, I think now it's more about how I uh, feel about the performance. You know, mm. sometimes there is applause, but then I'm not, I don't agree. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, you're very self-critical as a, as a professional dancer. You know, sometimes you, you should be and you have to be. Uh, to a certain extent, but yeah, now it's more if I agree, then I enjoy it. But if mm. I don't agree, then there's always this thing in the back of my mind where I think, uh, mm. it, I, I could have done a lot more, you know, okay. it could have been a lot better. Or I wasn't really in it, you know, that's True. also something then we're not really feeling the role. So there, you know, there's a good day and a bad day, but it's different, of course, than before. Before it was just pure joy and, you know, being there right. and big eyes and smile. Okay. 
Do you know that immediately when you could have done better or is it just when you maybe you you come down, you lie in bed and then you go like No, I know it right away. You know right away. Okay. I know it right away. But then what you do for self improvement for the next time, how do you push yourself? I think it depend depends on what it is, but if it's a technical issue then I just uh, you know need to work on this technical aspect. Because dance, that is the difficulty in dance, in this art form that is very technic, uh, mm. technical uh, influence that you have to have the control of your body, not just your mind, but also your body. And I think that makes it very hard. And so if it's a technical issue, then I just have to work on this movement pattern or True. the technique. So that yeah. is, and, but it's, if, if it's in more of an emotional um, let's say aspect, then there are other exercises or other ways to get into the role, for instance. Yeah, mm. so. Is there a ritual you do the moment before the curtain opens? I mean, I usually, I always was quite um, af afraid of failure. Yeah, that's part of the, I guess, part of every uh, artist who goes on stage, but for some it's more and for some it's less. So for, for me to build a bridge to not um, let this fear hinder me to, to do a good performance. I, uh, I, yeah, I start to find just ways to tell me, okay, let's say this is my last day on stage. Like, what what, oh, would, I, what okay. would I do if this were, or if this was my last day? Yeah. If you know, so if this was the last show I ever did, would I be afraid to do it, or would I give everything? Okay. To, you know, just give my best and my best last. So, okay. So that was actually always something that worked for me. And usually when I stepped on stage, this fear was gone. It was just quite, you know, before I was like, <gasps> you know, the heart started to, uh, it, yeah, it was, a, you know, a, okay. maybe a normal fear, I guess, not, not a fear of uh, not sweating fear, but, you yeah, know, yeah, certainly okay. that you're afraid, oh, is this going to go today? Uh, yeah. Kind of mindful also to put yourself in that situation. Yeah. So, yeah, okay, yeah. really cool. So now tell us then, how important is it to meet your personal goals within your artistic being? I think, um, of course, personal goals, every artist has, has them and wants to reach them. Um, I think I've learned that um, you can't reach everything that you like. Yeah, I wanted, you know, if, if, you want, if you say, I'd like to be a, a principal dancer at the Paris Opera, yeah, some things are just not reachable, maybe. Mm. You can go for it, you can, you can strive for that. I think I, I would recommend everybody to go for your goals and strive for what you want to achieve. Um, but in the end, um, I think more important is that you make yourself happy with what you do and that you enjoy what you do, because then, if you do enjoy it, uh, I think also something will come out that is authentic and that is actually then becoming art. So mm. it's not just about to look for fame or a rank or a, a position, but rather to be, um, yeah, to, to, to look into yourself as well and to be the, uh, your authentic self, to use your potential to the fullest. And then I think, uh, I think that should make you, yeah, that should be really what makes you happy, to okay. use your potential. Mm -hmm. What is art to you? Um, I think it's art, yeah, this is a good question because sometimes I'm asking this myself, but I think in dance or in this specific uh, form, uh, ballet, the problem in ballet is often that it, it starts very much with technique, with athletic movement, that that's what you learn and that's what you strive for, jumping, turning, yeah, all the men, they jump, they turn and the woman on point, etc., and high legs. But in the end, uh, for me, this is not art yet. This is, you know, athletic, uh, any, any uh, athlete does that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they do their best, physical best. I think the combination of this aspect and then also uh, your inner authentic um, emotions that you bring to the role or to the piece or to the steps that the choreographer gives you, uh, in, in, in this function as a dancer, yeah? Because usually a dancer doesn't necessarily uh, create the steps themselves, but in that framework of the steps, in that structure, how do you phrase, for instance, mm. a step? You can make an arm like this, you can make it like this, you can 
I don't know, have a little stuff. Yeah, so yeah. that is your responsibility as an artist to the movement quality, but also your emotional availability within this structure. And I think uh -huh. then it becomes for me art. Now, there are many other ways and many other art forms where you could have different uh, uh, combinations or, or different ways of uh, explaining what is art for you, but that is it for me. Mm. Yeah. And that is missing in dance often nowadays, especially in ballet, that uh, there's a lot of dancers that they're very athletic, but uh, there is missing this emotional connection with the movement and with the technique. Mm. Yeah. What should a dancer do to get to these emotions when they have the lack? I think, in my opinion, every dancer should at least once in their career and, and preferably early on uh, make an acting course or participate in an acting course okay. uh, and uh, yeah, work on on you know how how to approach a role, uh, emotional availability, doing exercises for that. Okay. Uh, because it is true that the technique is so overwhelming sometimes that you have nothing left in your brain, no brain capacity left to do something else. So if you don't rehearse that before, then it might be difficult uh, to do that on stage in a moment where it's, where it is stressful already. Okay. How does the dance differ to the art of acting? I think that's exactly what it is. That uh, in, I mean, acting is often, um, I mean, it is very hard, and there's a lot of technique in acting, for sure. Yeah. So it's 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 an it's a pipe dream if you think that an actor is just uh, you know can just take it out of the pocket and act. This is this is not true. And I was surprised that there's so much technique involved. But I think the difference is really um, this combination in a dancer that they still have to have this physical control, which is a lot harder to achieve, I think, than uh, for an actor, because an actor kind of is, is trying to, to um, reproduce what we normally do in life, yeah, maybe in certain extreme situations, mm. okay? But it is something emotionally what you've gone through Mm. You know, already as a kid, yeah. you have gone through the emotion of anger, fear, laughter, happiness, all mm. of that. We always want to relate to something. Yeah. Right. And as a dancer, it's especially in ballet, but also contemporary dance, it's very sometimes unnatural what you have to do. You have sure. to bring your body into shapes that are not naturally to you, not the, the pedestrian on the street would never get the idea to turn out the legs like this, put the legs up here, whatever. Yeah. And then on top of things, you need to act or you need to be a, a, pers uh, you know, a personality or you need to be a character on stage in addition to that. So this is, I think, for me, there's an addition on top of that. Talking about the character, is there um, like a dance or a role or a character that you missed out playing? Yeah, I have actually. And I'm sad about it and, and because also it's, it won't happen it anymore since I'm you know, past that age. But... Um, there's a role called Onyegin. It's from yeah. this novel, Eugen Onyegin. Um, and I really love that, that character. And I think it would, I think I actually really fit into this character very well. I think I could do it. I could dance it and play it well. But it was always either I was, I just left the company when they got this piece, the production, or I came too late and it was already finished. So yeah. Mm. <laughs> Oh, that's what can life. I do? But, <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's something that I, I, I always think uh, I could have done as well. Okay, good. Uh, mm, but circling back a little bit, according to your opinion, what does it take to be a professional dancer? You know, like there are maybe lots of, especially the younger folks, they, they, they are doing this as a hobby and then they want to take that step. What does it take to be there? I think it, it takes really this... Um, uh, yeah, the motivation and the willpower to have the grit to really um, go for your goals and um, and it take. I mean, it, it there's always a bit of luck involved as well, you know. So mm. it's. Uh, but I would say, never mind if somebody tells you you won't be a professional or you cannot make it. I think if you really want to make it, you can go at least to a certain point. You can make it. Maybe not to that point where you want to go, but to a certain point you can make it. So I think. Um, I mean, I believe if you really want something badly, then you can come at least close to your goals. Okay. And uh, I mean, for me, 
even when I, as a little kid, when I wa waited at the bus station, I still rehearsed some jumps at the bus mm -hmm. station, you know? And so when I lived in New York, I saw people in the, in the subway, you know, training their steps. This is, the, this is the energy you need. You need mm. to really, go 24 hours, it's not just one hour a day. Yeah, hardcore contribution. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's a lifestyle, it's not a job. Yeah. How do you rest and what do you do for self-care? Because it is a very, you know, it takes a lot. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, and that's underrated as well in dance. Um, I think, of course, it takes also a professional environment to be able to do that because otherwise it costs a lot of money to uh, go to physiotherapy and massage or whatever. So if you're in a professional environment already, it's easier because mostly then there is this on board in big companies, they have a physical therapist or a massage therapist. Um, but in general, um, if I don't have this, and for a while in New York, I didn't have this because I was studying there. Um, I, yeah, I would just self massage my legs and, you know, take a lot of baths and, but also for my mind, I would, um, I started to meditate. That was only later on, mm. like since maybe 10 years and do yoga and start to find ways to also de-stress and uh, decompensate. And, um, but I think for dancers, this is more and more important because it is a very stressful um, profession. And I, th I think a lot of dancers would benefit from doing that, you mm. know, meditation or even Tai Chi or something that kind of calms their mind down mm. yeah also maybe to activate some muscle groups that you normally don't yeah this is oh, yeah okay this i forgot is true that um, to to use gyrotonic and pilates which is a way of working different ways yeah. different muscle groups and go to the gym swimming is great uh, for mm. your back and so yeah i think intuitively you feel a little bit what you need but i think it's to sit on the couch at home is not the best relaxation yeah, that yeah. you can do. Okay. Yeah. Who were the three most influential persons in your life? That's a good question. Um, I, it's hard to say, but of course, teachers are always, you know, they have a strong influence on you. Uh, I would say first, my grandmother. <laughs> uh, I, I really had a wonderful relationship to her and she, um, I don't know, just this kindness and this, this empathy that she had uh, influenced me, I think. And uh, then teachers at the school, um, I wouldn't say there was one particular, well, there was one really very strict one. He was extremely strict, but I think once, one thing that stuck with me was that he said, I'm, I'm pushing you so hard because I want you to have a good life. Mm. And I realized, okay, he, he, it's not just he's mean, but he actually wants us to succeed. Maybe he could have had a couple of different approaches in, to, in terms of pedagogic approach, but um, he definitely had an influence on me that you have to have this grit. And then there was a dancer that I really um, admired in the State Opera House, and he had this unbelievable um, co uh, continuity of, of, of work that he was always good. I mean, even if he had a bad show, it was still very good. And that was for me also an example to see that um, this is also a big part of, the, of this profession to, to continue, continuously be on top of things, to not drop the ball. And so that, um, yeah, it was an example for me to, to see, okay, this is how you have to work to succeed, not just to be a one-day one shining star and then you're... Mm. you're which role did you enjoy most? I think, um, I think there were two. I have to decide between, uh, they were actually very classical roles, even though I danced a lot of other contemporary things, which I loved as well, but they were so outstanding and hard that um, they stuck with me. So it was this Sleeping Beauty um, in the choreography from Rudolf Noreev, which right. was a very famous dancer of its time. And... Uh, and then I danced the prince or the main part in Spawn Lake, um, also here at the Opera House. So I think these two roles were for me the most, um, I guess also because the music from Tchaikovsky is so beautiful and uh, it was just uh, unbelievable to, to do these two roles and to try to find also an interpretation of these roles that is maybe a little bit different than from 
other dancers. So. Right. Did you ever had like to put on like some ridiculous costumes where you oh, felt yeah. like really uncomfortable? Oh yeah. <laughs> you have a, you have a top three on there. <laughs> Uh, well, one was with uh, Ballet de Monte Carlo. They had um, a piece, actually, also, it's called La Belle, which is uh, the French version of uh, Sleeping Beauty at that company. And and there I had to be the, the king, but with a really weird uh, costume that was like, um, I don't know, it was like, I was like fat. And <laughs> so it was really ridiculous, and um, but fun at the same time. So I think I just enjoyed being, you know, in this ridiculous costume. And um, the, the second one, yeah, there was like, a, I think, a, a wolf or something. It was a wolf. Mm -hmm. We had a mask like this. We were like really, uh, so that was fun as well. And um, I, well, I think uh, the third one was just like a really odd color and a leotard, like full on leotard and like a, okay. a I think uh. a really odd color. And I felt like, ugh, this looks so <laughs> naked. <laughs> What was the biggest challenge you had with a specific role? You know, maybe you couldn't identify yourself really. Was yeah. there something like that? Yeah, I mean, I guess with all the roles, because the thing is, um, what I, I had the feeling what was lacking a little bit in my um, coaching often was that there was not much support in terms of what the role should be. There was a lot of support about, about technique, but not really so much uh, you know about the interpretation so this is something that you have to come up with yourself and it happens a lot with with you know dancers that the choreographer and the, the ballet masters they believe yeah he should you know find this out himself but oftentimes there is no time or so that's why it is a work that you have to often do yourself and so um, for instance with with Swan Lake or with Sleeping Beauty there was a moment I think that was in, in Sleeping Beauty there's a seven minute long variation which is like long as hell for a mm. dancer to be alone on stage and to jump, to turn, to balance. I mean, in the end, your calves are, you don't feel your legs anymore, yeah. basically. And um, so there was just how am I, what, what can I do to, to not feel, to not think about my legs so much and to really actually be in the role. And there was actually a, a very helpful um, advice from my uh, director at the time here in Berlin. Uh, Michael Denar is his name, and he said, you know, when you turn around, you're very tired, but when you turn around to the audience, when you face the audience again, imagine there's a big camera just zooming into your eyes on a big screen. That, and that, just this moment, so my eyes were radiating, I looked far, I, I had this feeling of looking where my future is, yeah, and okay. because this, this person is also, the character is looking for his future in this, in this right. variation, basically, and, or this solo, you can also call it a solo. And, uh, and that took me completely away from the technical aspect and from the knowledge that I have to do it again because it's kind of the second beginning yeah. you start again and you actually just want to go off stage, you know, <laughs> so that's how tired you are. But yeah, so that was basically for me an in interesting moment where I realized that with other aspects and other uh, thought processes, you can just uh, make it easier. Did you ever experience like missing passion you know, when, when you have such a long career, you know, you must, I don't know, want to give up sometimes. <clears throat> yeah. You know? yeah, yeah, no, I had this. I had this actually several times. Um, and that was mostly when I was not happy with where I was or what I danced. Uh, and maybe I felt a little bit um, undervalued as well. Mm -hmm. You know, that makes it very um, difficult then to keep the passion and to keep the motivation. And... Um, I think in that time you have to change something then to make it happen again. Yeah. So often that's why I oftentimes changed companies mm. um, to kind of get a new input, um, new ideas, maybe new environment as well. To I mean, when I went to Australia, for instance, that was not because the company was so amazing at the time, but I loved the director. He was a great teacher, and then just to be in this environment in a completely different uh, country with. Flora and fauna looked so different that you feel like you're on, you know, in a movie. So that was really a f very inspiring for me. And I had some amazing, um, yeah, I don't know. It started to really inspire me and I was very motivated to mm. give my best there. Yeah. Do you have like an ad advice for the next generation, you know, when, when maybe there's something that they could have done before, you know, because I, I think I have the feeling sometimes 
Um, well, we all do, I think, that dancers as well. But you, you just get used too much to your environment and then you start to just, I don't know, just repeat everything and you got a little bit stuck. I think stay curious and believe in yourself. Um, perseverance to not forget what your actual goals were and are. Um, I think if you get comfortable, that's usually not the best sign. Um, and priorities are, of course, changing in you know, during your career. So if you're, you know, a parent and you have kids, then of course maybe the kids or your your parenthood becomes more important than your career, and that is a priority. That is absolutely that's great to to have this. Uh, you know, if it's a conscious change, then I think it's very good. Um, but I, th I would say, you know, go for your goals, use your potential to the fullest, and that's the only way really to, to make yourself happy in this profession. Mm. Because it has a lot of challenges, and you get injured, and then you're down. I think if it's not wrong to, take, uh, to consider help, to, to, get to go to a counselor, to, to you know, ask for help is important. Um, I would definitely advise that. All right, okay. Now, the, you just mentioned also that you worked in so many different countries. Do, how do they differ, like in terms of colleagues, <clears throat> payments, audience, I guess, must be also different? Yeah, they do differ, actually. And um, sometimes it's really a different feeling to dance in one place than in another. Um, audiences are different. In some cities or opera houses or countries, uh, dance is much more appreciated. Uh, than somewhere else. For instance, mm -hmm. in Australia, dance was kind of, you know, people are very outdoorsy. They, they like sports, they like, you know, mm -hmm. Australian rules, football and all of that. And so dance, it's rare that a man would go to a ballet show. Yeah, that would, I mean, probably his friend has to pull him in, <laughs> but then they love it. So it's, it's um, I think, um, yeah. It does differ. And also, if you're in Zurich, in the Switzerland, if you dance there, you get a lot more money than if you dance, you know, somewhere in Zwickau or in, right. in a, you know, another company or... Uh, so, yeah, there, there are lots of differences. That's why I, I think you should, you know, inform yourself and go there where conditions are good, mm -hmm. where, you, where you appreciate it as an artist, because that makes you also strive. Um, or create something there where you are and then to kind of make a, make a wave, you know, make yeah. it, uh, set a trend. Yeah. Do you have some, some favorite city, country where you like to perform, where you think like all of these aspects, they fit just well? I mean, now I don't really perform anymore so much, it, but I, I, when I did, I, I actually really loved the touring, the traveling. And um, of course, in Zurich, when I was there, there's... The audience is amazing. They love dance. It's a very cultured audience. Mm. Uh, financially, it's amazing. You know, so okay. uh, so that is the place which is you know an amazing place. But also you have Paris. Uh, if you can you know perform at the Paris Opera, that is a you know it's a highlight. I'm sure. Right. Yeah. So okay. so there are a couple of different places which is uh, really uh, for for dancers. Uh, but I'm talking from my perspective, of course. Yeah, you know, of course. they're from a different perspective. People would say something completely different, yeah. right? So now talking about fair pay in the industry. So I think this is this is a topic <clears throat> that needs to be tackled somehow, because I hear that a lot, especially in the dance or in the performing world, we are kind of underpaid. Into your opinion how much should a dancer earn well i was usually quite lucky to be always in a in a usually usually very good contract so i i cannot complain about this so much but i i see that um a lot of dancers especially in smaller houses or smaller opera houses yeah let's say we talk about places like Zwickau, where i worked also as a ballet master there the pay was uh, very low for the dancers mm -hmm. and they were wonderful dancers. And so, um, of course, art is a luxury, but it's a luxury that we need as a society. So it's important to um, value that in terms of financial value. And um, I don't have the right solution because, of course, a city or a country needs to, you know, tackle all these issues that they are. But in general, I think 
that dancers are underpaid if you compare how short the career is, because it can how be very short, study. and how long they study, right? So you have to start as, I mean, if you want to be a professional, you usually have to start with 10 at least. That's already late, yeah? So with mm. 10, you have to start. So you have to put all your life into it. Maybe don't really have a childhood in, you know, in that sense, mm. what normal uh, youngsters have. And so if you, if you consider this, and then if you see a soccer player, yeah, then it, it feels really like, oh my God, this is, we work more than these guys, mm. or at least as much. And, yeah. but it has to do with popularity, of course. Of course, yes. yeah. I always find it, I don't know, mind baffling, you know, like, um, for example, lawyers are getting paid well, they study for seven years or eight years, doctors, eight yeah. to ten years, the same what every dancer is doing. Right. And it's <clears throat> just a fraction. Yes, this is true. I think we have to, you know, find also ways, I think, because young, dancers are so young that they don't stick together. Oftentimes there is lacking a bit of a, a union feeling. In the US, they have it a bit more, um, but I think here it should be more developed that there's a union, the rights that dancers have, the payment they should have. I think this is also coming. I see, I see changes there already. Uh, then also the freelance scene has to be also considered because there are a lot of freelance artists mm. around. They're very good. But for instance, what does a freelancer when, when they're injured? What do they do? So this is also a question what I ask myself, are they starving at the time? Because when they're injured, they, they cannot work. They cannot even go to the Arbeitsamt because they're not working. They cannot work. They're not eligible to get this money. So yeah, there are lots of things that have to be, I think, considered and yeah. changed. Yeah. What's the most underrated job in the entire entertainment industry? I mean, I don't know if it's the most underrated job, but I think uh, the, the stage technicians, um, they, they have a really tough job and they um, have to be there at all times, you know, before in the morning, before the rehearsal starts and in the evening after the show until sometimes one or two o'clock and they have to lift heavy stuff and all of that. I think it's a really tough job to do. And, um, you know, usually they're not really seen and nobody thinks about them. So I think that's one of the most underrated jobs in okay. the entertainment industry worldwide because th they are needed everywhere. You know, if it's a concert, if it's opera, whatever it is, a musical, they're always there. They need to be there. And without them, nothing works. Tell us about the moment in your specific case now when you first realized you want to become an actor. An actor. Um, you know, I knew that already before I wanted to be a dancer, actually. When I was oh. a kid, it, it's, you know, before I went to the ballet school, I, I, I guess I loved always these. Uh, I saw a movie about, uh, I think it was Winnetou. <laughs> and I thought, oh, I want to do this. So I, I thought this is something I want to do. But then dance came, uh, yeah, because my mother thought it would be a nice thing to be at the ballet school. And so this kind of happened and then I you know, went into this and, it, and I enjoyed it because it combines the both, b both art forms mm. in a way to a certain extent. Um, but that was always something in the, back of my, in the back of my mind that I thought, oh, I, I really would like to do that. And I actually, when I was in Australia, I was injured for a while and then I started to, to really go into it and start to do courses. I went to take classes and mm. I did an audition there as well. They have a fantastic acting school in Sydney. And um, yeah, so that was the first step into this direction. Now, talking about your acting career, is there something that you like playing the most, like drama, funny, action? Um, <clears throat> I mean, I would love to, to play in, you know, a, an agent or something, yeah, something right, with, okay. or a police guy. I think that would be something that I'd love to do. I think uh, also because of my features, I think because I have this little bit, mm. this thing, I think um, I, uh, yeah, I don't know. I would, it just uh, would, would enjoy that, I guess. And sometimes I, <laughs> I find myself like just uh, doing it myself in my living room or something, you know, mm, just okay. playing something. And uh, so I would, I think I would enjoy that. Um, but I, I think I also would love to be more on stage as an actor, not just in front of the camera, but okay. really on stage. Because um, when we worked uh, on certain roles in New York at this acting education that I did there, I really enjoyed that as well. And it kind of gave me the same kick as if I would be on stage as a dancer. Mm. The same, 
yeah, feeling in, in my yeah in my heart and this this uh, um, I don't know. Also, the focus the focus has to be so strong that it's like a meditation as a dancer mm -hmm. as well as an actor because otherwise you lose the lines or you're out of the character. So it is a bit it is a bit of a meditation, I would say. Right. Okay. Yeah. Is there like a specific movie where, where you would like to see yourself? Um, you know, like you, 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 had, you also had your favorite character in, in well, the dance world, so now you must also have like a movie. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I, no, I couldn't really say anything now specific, but um, I think something like this with this with this secret agent something in this kind of uh, even even something that's connected to my history maybe with uh, gdr with east berlin something okay. like that that uh. could be really cool because i have this i could really uh, yeah take from my story basically uh. as well you know to from my own experience okay um yeah but i couldn't really say now like this maybe it's not done yet yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I heard Daniel Craig uh, is not going to be James Bond anymore. So. I see. Well, I mean, I wouldn't mind if they call me. <laughs> right, okay, I can yeah. do this, the double O, whatever. Yeah. yeah, I think, you know, there is time for it. It's definitely time to have a new one. Yeah. <laughs> now, talking about the dance master class that you're doing now at the Paluka School, do you want to run us through what is that exactly? Oh, what so you're this doing? is um, actually a master of the arts. It's a, a to study um, to be a dance teacher, but really from the yeah to have this pedagogic knowledge. So it's a, a pedagogic studies and also dance medicine is part of this uh, study, which is yeah still undervalued. And a lot of teachers and coaches don't have that knowledge. And I think it's um, yeah more and more important to have this knowledge about. Mm dance medicine and about changing different or changing ways how to teach uh, dance and ballet also because ballet used to be taught uh, mainly in a very strict autocratic form that there was the teacher and the, the little student had to do whatever the teacher says mm. and that was it and you weren't allowed to ask questions and uh, and sometimes you know keys were flying you know if you didn't if you didn't straighten your knees Mm. So that's how I experienced it. But I think there are other ways that are much more humane, but also help you to be a professional dancer. And mm. uh, they're much more, they open much more your creative mind as well. They give more freedom and they en enable you to be more aut autonomous in your work. Um, and often this is a problem with dancers that have been taught autocratic that when they are left alone in this professional world that they don't know how to do things because there's nobody with the whip to, you know, to bring them into shape. So they have to do it themselves and then they fall into this gap right. before they you know, take themselves out again. So that, I think it's an important thing that uh, teachers and the, 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 the teachers of the future, that they start to really have a profound education and it's, shouldn't be as it used to be that just because you were a good dancer you must be a good teacher that's mm. not true at all sometimes sometimes the dancer that wasn't very good has a, a lot of talent to be a great teacher yeah. and so yeah what are there other subjects in the in, 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 in the class in the classes um well actually it's very broad and very layered uh, what i like also that we got taught things that I wouldn't have thought that we, we will have. So for instance, improvisation. Mm. For a classical ballet teacher, it's not really that you will ever teach that, but it's very good to have this idea that also the teachers in this program or the, the future teachers, the participants, they need to improvise, they need to go through all this motion, even you know with 45 or whatever, you have to still move there and do contact improv and all these kind of things, which I never did in my life before, okay. which is super interesting for me also to, you know, finally do this. Okay, so I dance all these things, but I didn't have this knowledge. So right. it would have been great to have it before, but yeah, so it's good to have this, uh, all these things. And like I said, dance medicine is very important. This is something, this knowledge, anatomy, dance medicine, uh, how to use your feet or what is the older connection from down to up. Um, mm -hmm. This is important, and there's music, notes, rhythm, working with pianists, all of that. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I think it's it's quite layered and and rich and interesting. So circling back a little bit, um, t talking about the 
dense education that every student has to go through and taking like evolution of everything in mind. Is there something or are there subjects that actually should be added to the dense uh, education? To the dance? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think, I think what I just said, dance medicine should be already taught before. It yeah. shouldn't be taught like when you're 40 and your dance career is over. It should be taught when you're 12, 13, yeah. you know, to, to start already to get the students the knowledge, okay, that's why I shouldn't uh, pronate or hyperpronate. I shouldn't fall in with my, I shouldn't roll over with my foot because then my meniscus suffers in 10 years. Uh, so this is something that I definitely would take on board. Um, there are also new ways of working uh, on the side, for instance, Pilates, that is kind of incorporated already. There's a, a, a workout that I enjoy very much. It's called gyrotonic. Mm -hmm. That's, I think, for dancers, very valuable because there's a lot of spiraling, which is in dance, very important spiral course, dynamic. Yeah. And so this definitely, I think there should be more uh, emphasis on musicality that it used to be that in Russia, every dance student had to play a piano. So, oh, wow. <laughs> so that is kind of lost here in Germany, at least. Okay. Uh, so oh. that could be something interesting if the time is there. I mean, it's also always a bit the time, yeah. If the time is there to, to have at least once in a while a workshop and playing an instrument to, to, to do that. And um, I think another thing that I would take on board in, in professional education uh, is, for instance, to have a school counselor or someone you know, students can go to mm. and talk about their problems because it is a tough education and it is a tough job after. So it's, I'm ready to get used to this as a student that this is okay to ask for help and to get the help. Uh, I think that is still underrated and not enough done. Mm, okay. What's the best piece of advice you have ever been given? I think perseverance to, to, to stick to what you set out for, to believe in yourself, even though it might be hard, um, because there will be better times if you're in a, you know, in a hole that you have to dig yourself out, but to, be, yeah, to believe in, in yourself, I think, perseverance, that is the best advice in this profession. Yeah. Because there will be moments where you will want to give up or where you, yeah, don't see the light at the end of the tunnel. And I promise you there is one. Your life as a performer, what are you happy for? I'm happy for the, for the luck that I had to be able to, in, in, to dance in so many wonderful companies, to work with fantastic teachers that uh, is not evident to have this. And oftentimes I had the choice even to go where I wanted. I auditioned and I got the job. So that's also, nowadays, maybe I wouldn't have so much luck anymore, you know, so because the competition is fierce, uh, also amongst men. With women, it's even harder. So I, I just, even though I feel like I could have done more, but uh, I, I appreciate that I had all these uh, experiences and some were hard as well because you know I went to New York I gave up everything and and went for uh, this dream of being an actor and that was difficult because I had a quite a status as a dancer and and I did this all my life and to stop this and then to go there and be a freelance dancer was a completely you know a jump in the cold water mm. um, but I'm still grateful for the people that I met there and uh, even for the you know, difficult times that I had because they made me what I am now. And now I can feel what other people maybe feel, which I didn't feel before because I had, you know, you know, it was quite going well, you know, so it's also important to, to see how does a person feel when it's not going so well. What are you doing now? Is there anything, is there, are you working on something? Are there any shows <clears throat> coming up? Well, I mean, actually there is something, in, a very new thing, which I haven't told you yet. And this is, um, uh, just happened recently that I um, I got a professorship at the Folkmark University in Essen, oh, wow. which is um, the biggest arts university in Germany, and there I'm a professor for classical dance. 
So that just happened recently, even though this application is going for a year and a half already, but I didn't even think about it anymore, or at least I thought, no, it's not going to happen. Um, so this came through, and now I just started there. So I just kind of settled in Essen. So I'm now going here back and, fr back and forth yeah. from Essen to Berlin because my son lives here. And so, yeah. And the great thing is they have quite a lot of semester holidays, which is because it's a university. So I have still time also to you know, work on acting projects and yeah. do other things and work also still as an artist and not just as a teacher. Uh, but I appreciate both. So, yeah, that's the newest thing, right? Now. Yeah. <laughs> that's amazing. One of our signature closing questions is, if you had the chance to put anything you want on a giant billboard, <laughs> what would that be? I would say use your potential and believe in yourself. Perfect. That's a beautiful <laughs> answer to a very awesome interview. I thank you very much. Jens thank you, Paul. Thank you very much.